there is this kind of mainstream narrative that is focused on law enforcement as a perpetrator and and not law enforcement as 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 a guardian or as a protector and i think it's really dangerous and i think we're starting to see you know you look in cities like san francisco and and Portland and, and Seattle, you're starting to see the byproduct of that. Hey guys, check out the 2023 Street Cop Conference, April 23rd through the 28th, Gaylord Convention Center. It's going to be the event of the year. Keynote speakers include Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed Bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, the youngest living Medal of Honor recipient, Navy SEAL Jason Redman, Fox News host Tommy Laren, Marine Corps Special Forces and Leadership Coach Cody Alford, Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Sheriff David Clark, and Sheriff Mark Lamb. It's going to be one hell of an event. And on top of that, we have all of our instructors and additional instructors from other companies going to be at the event, giving you everything they know for you to have a successful career and get the results you want to get in the field as a police officer. On top of attending the event, you'll get face-to-face time with every instructor attending the event, and all the keynote speakers will spend time with you. we got special events all week, giveaways, nightlife. It's going to be really, really worth your time, energy, and effort. I promise you, you will not regret it for a second. To register for the conference, check out streetcop.com, click conference, and everything you need will be there on the homepage. If you are looking for a room, just click book a room. The block has been sold out at the Gaylord Opryland Convention Center. But there are many hotels nearby within a walking distance of the event. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity. We will see you there. You trying to be a street cop? Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. Just got a haircut too, by the way. Looking fresh, right? Thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. And uh, today we have John Becker from Aardvark Tactical on the show. And John, I appreciate you coming here. Maybe you can give us a little context of who you are, your background, your bio, and maybe your orientation in life. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I uh, started Aardvark at 17 years old, which was 37, almost 38 years ago now. Um, I gotta, Hold on, let's pause for a second. You look fantastic for your age. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish I felt fantastic for my age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now I, I uh, started when I was 17 and started, started doing rock climbing equipment and started to do a lot of tactical teams, special ops units, and they started asking for more gear. And, and my, my thing was, I always wanted to know more about the gear than the end user did. Cause I didn't want to be a sales guy. I felt like I need to be a consultant. And as a, as a business strategy, it turns out that was pretty good because the teams that I dealt with started asking for more gear. Can you get us this? Can you get us that? I'd say, I don't know anything about that. And they're like, oh, we're doing a class, come down. Well, it turns out the guys that I was working with then and that ultimately brought me up were the founders of special tactics in the United States. It was the guys that had founded LAPD's team, that had founded LA Sheriff's team. And, you know, I, I always say my story is tactical Forrest Gump. I was in the right place to meet the right people at the right time. And I would never turn down free training. So by the time I'm 25, I've gone to law school. I'm clerking at the LAPD police litigation unit writing on a lot of law enforcement stuff, teaching. And I would never teach tactics, obviously, because that's not my job. But, you know, I understand gear really well. I understand chemical agents and less lethal and just was in the right place at the right time to meet the people who were the real thought leaders in the market. And uh, and that grew into this amazing business that you know, I've now spent my entire life doing. Tell me about the business. So uh, my job is to protect tactical operators. And and my end user may be a police officer, you know, working in Hoboken, New Jersey. My end user may be, a, you know, an LAPD SWAT officer, an LA Sheriff SWAT officer, an NYPD ESU, you know, operator. It may be a tier one operator from one of the tier one units. It may be an international counterterrorist unit, uh, or it may be a United States Marine standing a post in Afghanistan. But everything that we do is geared towards protective equipment. So it's, it's less lethal and armor and, you know, optics and, and technology, drones, robots, all of that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool, man. So obviously you started at 17, it progressed 25, you're clerking at the LAPD sheriff's office. Do you ever get the inkling or the desire to get into the black and white and go and cruise? So strangely, no, um, it, it has never been there. I mean, I've spent a lot of time, I spent my entire life immersed in law enforcement and it was, the job was never interesting to me. The protection of the operator was what was, what was interesting to me. So it was, I, my job is basically to be like a medieval armor 
right? My job is to keep you as safe as you can possibly be while you go do what I think is one of the most selfless jobs possible. And it's, it's been, it's been a fantastic career because it's, there is not a lot of people who are focused on the protection of people who put themselves in harm's way for others. And so it's, it's, we're in a very unique niche and yeah, it's never, it's never been an appealing job to me, but I love my operator. If that makes sense. Yeah. Tell me about why you went into this industry to protect cops. So it's kind of by accident. I mean, I sat next to a girl and I left high school at 17, went to college, sat next to a girl that worked for a rock climbing equipment company. And she said, we should start a mail order business. And we did. And just right away, because we were doing ropes and harnesses, it was law enforcement that I started to deal with. I grew up in a law enforcement family. I grew up in a military family. Um, and, you know, it. I was so lucky that the people that met me early on were just such amazing guys and had had such a profound influence worldwide, actually. You know, if you think about it, I mean, special tactics starts in the 70s. And by the time it's taking full swing, 84 Olympics is the thing that ultimately gives rise to SWAT nationwide. And really, you see a move from kind of a counterinsurgency mindset to a hostage rescue mindset geared towards the 84 games in in LA. And I just happened to get there right after that had exploded. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I didn't, I didn't think this was going to be what I did with the rest of my life. Even when I went to law school, I mean, passed the bar, got out and realized I had worked for attorneys at police lit that we were self-insured. We defended the honor of the officers. We, we would fight cases. We thought we might lose because the cops had done the right thing. Then I got out and realized that's not what civil litigation looks like in, in private civil litigation. That is an insurance company settling a case out from underneath somebody. And I didn't know very many happy, happy lawyers. And the business had really started to take off. We were doing a lot of military stuff. And it was just at that point that, you know, it's like, what, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? So I maintained my license. That's the best business degree in the world. Still right on law enforcement, you know, legal issues, and and I'm still interested in civil rights litigation. But uh, the the job kind of picked me. So what are those things that you guys implemented that really helped and changed the game a little bit? So if you can go back and maybe think about one or three or seven items that you guys said, you know what, we think that this might be a good fit for tactical response teams. Um, let's start implementing it. And you may have been one of the originators of it, or at least took an idea and really expanded with it. So a couple of things. I mean, I got there right as flashbangs really started to be used. And so flashbangs were were an area that that I studied extensively. One of my mentors who recently died was Sid Hale, um, who was, you know, president of Cato and commander in the, the sheriff's LA Sheriff's Department. Uh, Sid is a legend. Sid literally wrote the NTOA's book on flashbangs. So flashbangs were a, a key thing early in my career, less lethal. Um, I kind of, my career parallels the rise of less lethal, um, both impact, chemical agents, OC. So so it's kind of that. And then more recently, it's been armor. Uh, we started our own armor company because I was so frustrated with the armor industry um, that I, I could never get what I wanted built for my teams. And so we started a company called Project 7 or a brand called Project 7 that is specialized tactical armor. It's very high end tactical armor, um, but it's given us the ability to custom design and, and build from the bottom up um, really state of the art stuff. And then technology has always been something that's been important in my career. Um, You know, whether it's drones or robots, anything that allows us to put distance between a suspect and an operator is really where my career is focused. Before we go any further, I think that I've got to pay context in mind to the fact that a lot of our audience was not even born in 1984. I was a very young man. Uh, I was a baby. I was three years old in 1984. So nice. maybe you can reaccount for what occurred at the 84 Olympics so people just know. So if you if you look at the kind of history of special tactics, really it starts in 1972. Um, LAPD starts a full-time team in 71, but 72, you have the Munich, what's called the Munich massacre, which is where, uh, terrorists take the Israeli, uh, athletes hostage in the Munich Olympic village. And by the time they're done, all of the 
all the hostages are dead. It is, it is a debacle in part because you had an organized, you know, PLO based black September group who were there to make a spectacle and a German military and law enforcement who were unprepared for hostage situations because it wasn't, you know, it's just becoming a thing to take hostages. And so by the time you get to the 84 Olympics, we've gone through all of these great terrorist incidents, you know, the Munich massacre, the uh, Prince's Gate Iranian embassy crisis, Mogadishu, Somalia. And those events set a stage in the U.S. where when the Olympics come to L.A., they realize, one, terrorism is a thing and is a real threat. And two, we cannot allow that to happen in the U.S. So there is a buildup among LAPD, LA Sheriff, and FBI to prepare for those kinds of an event. What do we do if people take hostages? What do we do you know, if we have some kind of terrorist incident? And that kind of lays the foundation for the expansion of special tactics in the United States. Um, as they prepare for those events, they're training with military units, they're training with international units. And that is the foundation nationwide for what we regard as modern SWAT, you know, being able to do hostage rescue and being able to do barricades all kind of has its genesis at that time. Well, the 84 Olympics, what, what happened there? Nothing. I mean, it, it was, it was literally an uneventful event. And that was, that was because they had spent so much time preparing that, you know, nothing happens, which was a huge success, especially in that time period. That's right at the end of kind of the golden age of terrorism. And it, it's, if you look at the history of special tactics, that's also the pivot point. You know, you've got Reagan in office, the war on drugs is going on. You have rock houses in New York, LA, New Jersey, um, crack cocaine is, is kind of taking hold. And that's where you see the transition from SWAT to being kind of focused on hostage rescue to being more focused on drug warrants. And that leads to a more modern era where we have kind of a balance uh, among what SWAT teams do. What frustrated you about the armor industry that got you motivated to enter into this side of it? I think that what frustrates me is it's not just the armor industry. The entire tactical industry is, you know, there, there are certainly great participants in, in that market. And there are people that really care about the end user. There are also, you know, nefarious participants and people that don't care. Um, I've written two different articles for NTOA raging about the armor industry because it's, there is an assumption that the industry is caring for the end user. And although there are examples of that occurring, there are also the exact opposite examples. And I think what people don't understand about the industry is there is no one that is policing the industry. Uh, the article that I just wrote for NTOA, which will probably be out in the next, the next issue of their Tactical Edge magazine, um, says, you know, everybody assumes that there's somebody that's checking the body armor industry and paying attention. And NIJ does that for products that are submitted to NIJ. If you, if you, you know, take the time to send a product to the lab and submit it to NIJ for compliance, yes, NIJ is paying attention. But there is no NIJ, you know, squad that's running around checking armor companies. There's no... You know, there's nobody that's running around looking at the robotics industry, specifically focusing on making sure that what you're getting is safe and works. That responsibility lies on the end user. And I didn't realize when I started the business, but being brought up by operators and, and armoring my friends changed the way that I looked at my responsibility. Um, I, I saw, I realized that I have a responsibility for my end user's safety and it, is constantly frustrated me when I see the industry doing something that I think is counter to the safety of the end user. I think that we're probably motivated for the same reasons. I'm in law enforcement training. Um, similar, obviously we're in the same realm, but similar circumstances. People often ask me, why did you, uh, why did you want to do street cop training? What made you start teaching classes? And well, the first motivation was I knew that I had a lot to offer. And the second one was I was going to a lot of classes and I, did, I knew they could be better. I knew that yeah. the training could be better. The experience in general could be better. And really, even so, we have a guy coming on today for our company. He is a very, very talented. Everybody's giving him a thumbs up from the tactical side of things. You know, uh, all these cool things are happening. But when I set him up with one of our onboarders who essentially helps them build, design, and create their program for the classroom. He's like, dude, the guy's great. He's great. His fucking tactic knowledge is great. He know he's the guy. 
his PowerPoint is so fucking bad. He had yeah. been working with on it, you know? So I went through three police academies and I got to see the lack of caring of this opportunity we had to take people's time, essentially four to six months for the most part in every state in this country of a police academy and do something really good with it. Uh, instead, it's more of just checking a box. And unfortunately, in an industry or any industry where there's money is on the table, people are showing up uh, maybe sometimes with the right intention, but with the wrong program. Or they're showing up with the wrong intention and the wrong program. And I try to give people advice about, hey, you know, look, I think you really got to be able to discern, does this person actually care? And they're trying just their shit sucks. And they just do a shitty job of displaying what their knowledge basis is. Or are they really slimy and sneaky and just want your cash? Because there are people in this industry for law enforcement training, we're talking about civil litigation, life and death that are showing up and unbeknownst to them or, or, or actually unbeknownst to the, to the end user, they think because somebody has something on their collar or some kind of certificate or something on their sleeve that says there are somebody in this fake world of law enforcement, they go, oh, this guy's a so-and-so. He must know what he's talking about. And unfortunately, what we found out is typically it's quite the contrary, not all the time. But a lot of these men and women in this profession will try to hang their credibility as an instructor of the program on their rank title or certificate. And it's fucking flabbergasting. So when I show up and say that, those people try to run interference like, oh, fuck this guy. Look, man, it, the beauty of business, and you could agree with this, John, uh, is for the most part, he who has the best product usually will prevail. Uh, even, even if you run your company not intentionally incorrect but you're just kind of a fucking messy person and you're, but you're going with your heart, your soul, but you just aren't like, you know, maybe organized or have the machine running correct, or you don't want to expand. But if you think about it, like look at Tarrant Tactical, and I don't know much about their business platform. The guy has a great social media presence, but from what I'm told is the guns he makes are so fucking expensive. He's not trying to mass produce them, but I'm told that gun is the best gun you that money can buy, right? Like Tarrant Tactical, so thought out, and there's a free plug for them, right? Um, their, their social media is legit. But I've told there's like a significant waiting list to, to get a Tarrant tactical gun. Now, and you probably have your gun guys right now are like, oh, that's not true. Blah, blah, blah. I could build that for this. Listen, I, I'm not sitting here proclaiming to be a gun expert. That's not the point. The point is, I don't know what his business plan is, but you get a guy like that who builds these beautiful, beautiful products that apparently people are going fucking bonkers for. You almost couldn't put your, even if he was crappy at business, which I'm sure he's not, you couldn't put him out of business because there's so much love. The product is so good and he's probably a good dude for building the product. And, and those people tend to stay afloat pretty much on their own without any other side of understanding the business thing because of the product being so good. So you have a really good product you know, I think that you can last a lot longer where a lot of times people have a shitty product or the people who are shitty with bad intentions, their motivations aren't good. They'll find themselves going out of business pretty quick. And you'll see these people in the beginning typically going what, like getting real good metrics up front, right? Really stealing the show for a hot minute until people realize that either the product's a piece of shit or they're a piece of shit. What do you think about that? You know, it's interesting. You said a lot there. I, yes, I agree. Uh, part of the whole idea behind Project 7 as an armor brand was we are going to build a non-compromising product. We are going to build the best platform we can build. And it's not going to be cheap and we're not going to compromise. But, it, it, you know, it's it's interesting because what you laid there is the foundation for why I started the podcast, actually, is the originally there was a filtration process that occurred with tactical information. Because information was difficult to come by, you had gatekeepers. I mean, the NTOA's Tactical Edge magazine being an example, where John Coleman, who ran the NTOA, was a gatekeeper. And when you wrote an article and submitted it to NTOA, it was vetted and it was it was peer read. That's still true with NTOA. They're still peer reviewed. And so you you filtered down the amount of information and what came out in that magazine was fantastic. As information has become easier to access, as we have been able to gain direct access to end user through the internet. The volume of information has gone up so much that it, I think it is more difficult for a quality product to rise, especially in training, 
there are, I don't know how many guys doing freaking tactical training right now. It is all over the board. Everybody's doing, you know, every, every former seal, every, you know, former tactical operator, everybody's got a class, everybody's doing online training. And I think it has become more difficult for an end user to initially filter quality from, from, you know, sizzle from steak for lack of a better term. And one of the things that you said that I love, and I, I use an analogy to explain it. The first guy that found a rattlesnake got bit by the rattlesnake. If he didn't tell anybody, every single person that saw the rattlesnake after that got bit by the rattlesnake. If he went back and said, Hey, this is what a rattlesnake is. This is what it does. This is what it looks like. Nobody ever got bit again. Your job, what you're doing with your podcast is describing rattlesnakes. You are explaining to people, Hey, this is a dangerous thing. This, you need to think about this. This is the stuff that can hurt you. And, you know, I think that the whole point of, of podcasts like yours and the training business that you're running and, and the stuff that I'm writing on and our podcast is to try to bring the state of the art, the best experts on topics to a broad audience. Because, you know, the, the guy that runs LAPD's team might meet a hundred cops a year, but if he teaches or he comes on a podcast, he might reach 10,000 or a hundred thousand, right? If, if Dennis is teaching by himself, you might teach two or 300 cops a year with your podcast. You're reaching hundreds of thousands of them. Right. And, and in the process saying, Hey guys, if you find this long skinny thing and it's got a rattle on its tail, just leave it alone. Don't fuck with it. It's going to hurt you. And for me, that's the most valuable service that we can provide to an end user is to bring them high quality information, to share it broadly and to help them become more discriminating about the training they're doing, about their tactics, about the gear they're buying. and. That was honestly, that was a lot of the root for the debrief podcast was my frustration with how many people were out there saying things that you're just like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. And he has a giant platform. We actually, and I'll try to keep this as vague as possible. Then I'm going to move on to my other point. But uh, this morning I received a message from somebody who's a legal professional in the field. And he had, he wanted to disagree about something we put out um, regarding our legal advice on something in general. So I don't want to keep it super vague. Yeah. And, you know, I put in a group chat with our legal guys and I was like, hey, I want to invite this kind of podcast, you know, and then he's going to obviously try to go and figure out compliance if he's allowed to come on the podcast, whatever it may be. But the reality is. I am eager to invite um, to see how it actually works out, because either there's going to be a really, really thoughtful thing that we've missed from his side or to expose a lot of things that I've been saying for quite a long time about the reality of what you're dealing with in this profession. So I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating looking at that. Back to what you said about all these training and tactical companies. What I like about when there's a lot of things to choose from is that even though you might stumble across the first thing that sucks, I think if you keep searching, you'll find something that's great and you'll, you'll know how to compare the two. What I like about being many options is one, I think that the quality of training out there has to improve. You don't have to just go to one place. You can say, hey, uh, you know what? And by the way, let me just be very clear. People know that I have relationships with a lot of police training companies and they're friends of mine. And uh, you know, I think a lot of them are really thankful to be friends with me, but I'm thankful to be friends with them as well. So if I have a little bit more of a skill at growing this thing, I want to bring them along for the ride because I think people need to hear what they have to say. I think their shit's quality. And, and and the latter, right? I just don't have any interest in promoting a company that has bad values, is run by bad people. Um, they don't play correctly, right? They're knocking buildings down, not helping people, not trying to build the biggest building. So eventually, as you get into the tactical field, you'll probably find more and more of these companies having such a qu more quality product because the competition gets so, so interesting. For us, we essentially have one thing that a lot of people don't have and even some companies out there that think they have it and that's our knowledge on the application of case law and how to direct men and women in the field on 
what are proper constitutionally compliant actions. So for us, we'll always have that edge on everybody else because we kind of haven't found anybody else that really understands, interprets, and communicates it back. And that's a little bit of a humble brag, but it's not just me. It's Zach Miller who sits here with me. He's one of our top guys. Guy's been reading case law for 19 years, and he really, really gets it and knows how to explain it as well. Even I get caught up sometimes. Zach surprises me. I'm like, oh, fuck, I never... I didn't know they they saw it. That was like, yeah, it's a little different. I'm like, that's interesting, dude. I'm glad I have you. Um, as we're talking about vests, in 2004, I worked for the United States Park Police in Washington D.C. and we were given tact. We were given our bulletproof vests. Some people didn't even get them. Like I forget, they were like missing a few. And right before I was leaving, there was a recall on the vests. So like hundreds of our cops had to go back in because the vest actually didn't stop bullets. We're in Washington, D.C., one of the one of the country's biggest crime rate capitals in the whole world. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's such a dangerous place. Cops are getting shot there. And our vests had failed that the, the agency bought these vests. And from what we understand is none of them stopped bullets. So you had hundreds of cops in the street with these faulty vests to allude to you claiming what you have such an, you know, such you have a difficulty with. So what would you tell somebody? Who is shopping for tactical stuff? You don't have to name brands or open yourself for litigation or slander. I keep it very vague myself. People tend to figure out pretty quickly when they go to a training program. Like I get those messages all the time. Like I'm in this class. It's fucking terrible. I'm like, what'd you pay? Like nothing. I'm like, okay. Right. Like who's being, who's teaching it. I could just hear the title of who's teaching it. I'm like, yeah, you're, you're in for it. You're a, it's a death sentence. Um, you know, 10 minutes into it, I want to leave. You should want to stay somewhere 10 minutes into it. So I can give people advice like that for my side of things. But you got a cop, you got an agency, they're shopping for tactical gear. What are some things, knowing what you know about the armoring, bulletproof vests, shit like that, industry that they should know? I think the first thing is you need to be educated. You cannot assume that the industry is telling you the truth or has your best interests at heart. You need to understand if you are tasked with buying armor for your agency or you are tasked for buying armor for your team, you need to be educated. You need to understand the NIJ standards. You need to understand how armor is tested. And it's not hard to figure it out, but you can't just assume that somebody telling you something is true. That's one. Two, I think any gear you're going to buy, you need to take the time to really understand what you need it to do. Because especially in law enforcement, one of the differences in dealing with law enforcement and military is the military defines a requirement before they seek a product. So they will say, we need an intermediate, you know, we need a, a non-lethal solution that will reach from X distance to Y distance, what's on the market. In law enforcement, we're more inclined to find something that's shiny and, and new and try to figure out how to fit it into tactics. And I think it's, I think it's a dangerous trap that we can fall into because there's a lot of really shiny, glitzy stuff, especially now coming on the market, some of which doesn't meet your needs. So rather than starting with the technology, start with the requirement. What do we want this to do? It isn't just about stopping, you know, yeah, obviously it needs to stop bullets, but you know, what do we need to armor? Making the trade between comfort and protection is something you need to do consciously and really research the companies. Like if it's, if it's a brand new company that hasn't been around a long time and they're using imported materials and you kind of get those heebie-jeebies about what they're doing. Um, you need to run away, and and armor. I would say armor, condoms, and brain surgeons is not a place for you to save money, because you can you can inexpensive yourself into a product that is not going to save your life. The recall that you're talking about was in 2004. It was a Zylon recall, and it was NIJ decertified an entire material, and everything got recalled that had that material in it. And part of it was because the NIJ standard, although well-intentioned and well-written, was exploitable. And so you had companies, one in particular that, that subsequently went bankrupt, who were taking the very edge of the standard, which was that you could submit a vest more than once. So if it didn't pass testing, you could retest it, which if you've ever shot armor, you know, every time you shoot it, it does different stuff. So you could build right to the edge fail, resubmit the same package, fail, resubmit the same package, pass, and that now is a certified product. Uh, NIJ also didn't have standards for sizes 
So the same company was submitting horse blanket size vests and passing. So now you have a giant vest that's barely meeting the standard and maybe failed twice before it passed. And that's what the package is going to be. And on the day it's shot is the strongest the material is ever going to be, right? Because you're going to throw it in the back of your car and you're going to wear it and you're going to sweat on it. And they were building a package that as it declined, stopped working. Wow. I had one officer, Eddie Limbacher, who was shot in, in Pennsylvania, had a penetration, fortunately didn't die. Another one, Tony Zapatella in, Oce in Oceanside, who did. <clears throat> At that point, NIJ recalled Zylon and pulled all the vests in off the street. And, and so that's exactly what I'm talking about. You can't assume that just because a company is telling you, hey, this product's great, that it is. You really need to understand the people you're buying tactical equipment from. It really matters. Your life depends on it. And it's very easy to become complacent with gear. And the same thing that you see in training tactics, it's very easy. You've done 10,000 traffic stops, right? Nobody's ever shot you. What are the odds it's the next guy? They're the same every time. <laughs> and the fact that you've done 10,000 doesn't make it any less likely that this is the guy. Um, and so it's, it's complacency is a really dangerous thing in our industry. And I think that part of, part of education is helping people understand, like you really need to pay attention to this stuff. It's very easy to get caught up on shiny glitzy stuff, but quality really matters. And, you know, we recently had a save in our armor and it's, I mean, the guy was shot eight times. He was shot twice in the vest. Uh, if his vest fails, he dies. And I think it's very easy for the industry to go, what are the odds a guy gets shot in the vest? What are the odds it's with a round that's right at the edge of the performance of the vest? You know, it's, it's so unlikely that it's going to be a problem that it's easy to go. Yeah, it's not that big a deal. Um, the problem is for that guy, it is everything. And, you know, I think that's why what you're doing educationally wise, you know, the, everything that we're doing from a writing standpoint, from a podcast standpoint, that's the goal, right? The goal is to bring the highest level of expertise we possibly can to the broadest audience we possibly can and make the end user smarter. Because especially in our industry, man, knowledge is what saves you. And the absence of knowledge is is a very, very dangerous thing. And essentially no different than a piece of equipment. If we are failing in what we're doing and what we're teaching, um, and by the way, I think that we at least move the improvement ratchet up a little bit. It may not be the end all and be all, but I can promise you it's better than the way you've been doing things. Uh, if you have a better solution, we'd love to hear it. But this is the best we've found thus far. But I think it's anything. Like if technology improves in in body armor, this is the best we have thus far in five years. Technology will be better. There might be better things for us to work with later on, but here's what we're doing. This is what we're seeing. This is how we're correcting it. And I often tell people like, look, one of the best things you can do is go and watch videos of police officers killed in the line of duty. Yep. And, and as hard as this is to do is to try to critique what the fuck happened, what went wrong, where did they make the mistake? What, what could you do in the future that wouldn't jeopardize you or put your safety in jeopardy? And the crazy thing is, and I, I'm just throwing a ballpark, no factual statistical data out there. And believe me, nobody bleeds blue more than me. And my heart hurts every time. And I just hate seeing cops getting killed. Um, but in order to save ourselves, we do have to do this Monday morning quarterback, quote unquote, to ensure that like we can look at the past and what was the problem? What was the mistake? How do we fix that? What could have been a better solution? What have you even given this man or woman the odds to improve or, or be safer? Because uh, we can't do anything about them anymore, unfortunately. That's as as insensitive as that may sound. It comes from such a deep, good place in my heart to protect these men and women who go out every single day and now are still enduring possible similar safety threats. So, you know, it's the same shit on our end where we want to make sure that, you know, you're not getting at the very minimum, like. Internal affairs will have nothing to stand on if you take actions like this, because here's the case let support say you could do it. You could do this all day, but your civil litigation suit will be dismissed because you follow the color of law. You follow the Constitution. When you're not being taught this stuff, you're not employing this stuff, you're actually violating rights. Unbeknownst to you, you're still be civilly liable. Hey, here are seven ways to adjust how you do a traffic stop that nobody's ever shown you. And dude, like one of the simplest things we talk about is if you hear nothing else out of my mouth, it's the passenger side approach. Number two, um, 
Why are you not walking out off the car, taking a look inside the car before you even approach the car? You'll see on many of the videos you watch, as soon as the cop gets up to the car, pow, that's when it happens. So why are we not creating distance 10 feet off the car? And then people will start to complain. Well, I work in the city. I don't have 10 feet. I get it. I understand. But every time we choose a place where we want to stop a car, let's be thoughtful about where that's going to be. Let's try to get them off the highways. Let's try to always be thoughtful about getting these cars outside, you know, if you're on the shoulder, maybe get onto the grass. You know, where are you going to put your car? How are you going to turn the wheels? Um, you know, all these things are super important. And unfortunately, not everybody is thoughtful enough or has the brain power to come up with these solutions, yet they are tasked with a duty to do so. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the Street Cop Podcast, do us a favor and go with, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us. Tell a friend. We don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar, Street Cop Training. Give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast, and it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally, and we also entertain you as well. So if you can imagine... It's no different than somebody who has no business experience coming into your business going, hey, I'm here to run your business. And you go, hold on a second. <laughs> uh, what's your cry? What, what have you done? How many businesses have you ran? Have you, have you grown it? None. None. My grandfather owned a, like a, a small taco stand 23 years ago. I used to see how that shit's done. But I'll take over. And you're like, yeah, but you don't have any experience with this. Like, how do you know what the solution is? Now, I took a few classes on how to run a business. I'm going to put some shit together. It's like this train the trainer thing. Uh, in the police educational field, we can't stand train the trainer. Essentially, that's why 95% of people who apply to be instructors at this company are never going to become instructors at this company because how can you make somebody an expert in three days? on a, on, on a and Not only an expert, then somebody who's going to be thoughtfully thinking about how to improve the ratchet, the process moving forward on what the next step in the agenda is going to be. What you're going to have is stagnant, stale training because even us as trainers, my class 10 years ago looks nothing like it does now. But my job as a leader of a training company is to constantly improve the process of how do we become better and better and better? How do the products look better? What other ones complement our good products? I don't know if you could say this, but I wonder if uh, being that the company that failed is out of business, what was the name of that brand? Do you know? Can it you say second it? Chance. That's what that was the, that was second the best chance who was subsequently yep. bought by Safari land and, and revitalized and has become a, you know, fantastic brand again, but yeah, it was yeah. second chance. You, you raised a really interesting point there, Dennis. So when I started my career, the way that SWAT teams learned and, and, and became educated about operations was through debriefs. Uh, the first 20 years of my career, I went to literally hundreds, maybe a thousand individual debriefs where a team would have an operation. They would internally debrief it. And then they would get together with all of the local teams in some cases, they would do it on a national basis at the NTOA conference, and they would say, here was our operation, here's what happened, here's what we saw, here's what we did, here's the choices we made, and here's what we screwed up, so that the next team wouldn't make those mistakes. And there was a heavy emphasis on debrief. There was a heavy emphasis on lessons learned. And that culture became part of our business culture. So for 20 years, we've done an evening lecture series. Um, you know, I'm I'm fortunate enough to work with most of the top teams in the world and have access to an amazing amount of information. And every once in a while, somebody would have an operation. And so we will, you know, at our place, we'll pull together a private event, handpicked audience. We'll bring in the team. Uh, we've done this with, we did it with BRI following the Bataclan raid. We just recently did it with LAPD on two of their hostage rescues. Pull, pull together teams, sit them down. And, and let them sit through a debrief. And because we're a private business, I can exclude the media. I can make rules that nobody records anything. You know, we can get candid, direct feedback. And that culture actually was what became the genesis for the podcast. Because what I started to realize is the smartest guys in the room, the most experienced guys in the industry, frequently don't talk about it. They don't share information. And I was one of our friends, a guy named Tim Anderson, who was a Marine Colonel and a, a sergeant at LAPD, a, amazing guy, had spent a bunch of time with Sid Hale and, and Dick Odenthal putting together tactical science and fusing military doctrine and law enforcement doctrine. And Tim was, was brilliant. Tim got ALS and, and went pretty fast. And a bunch of us were standing at Tim's funeral. And I said, guys, do you realize how much we lost today? 
do you realize we just lost 50 years of military and law enforcement experience and we didn't capture what was in Tim's head. We didn't, you know, there's no, there's no series of Tim teaching on video. There's no recordings of his thoughts. He didn't write a book. Every lesson Tim ever learned just evaporated in seconds. And it started this conversation about, we've got to come up with a way to share this information and, and get these lessons learned and, and get these experiences and get the events that these guys have been through on tape, on video, on audio, on something, and be able to share them with a broader audience. So when we lose them, we, we don't lose the information. And that discussion led to, uh, one, again, one of my mentors, Sid Hale, saying, look, if you want to do this, you're going to have to do it. Because we're not going to talk to anybody because it isn't safe for law enforcement to talk to the media. It isn't safe for law enforcement to go on video and record things unless they can control the narrative. And he said, you know, I'm not going to talk to anybody. These teams aren't going to talk to anybody. So if you want to do it, you're going to have to do it. And that was what gave rise to the first season of the debrief was just the realization that I had access to information that not a lot of people had access to that I was trusted enough that these guys would share the information with me and, and, and give me an opportunity to tell their stories and that I had the means to do it. And so, you know, we started off the great irony of the whole thing is the first episode, the first two episodes was with Sid Hale and Sid, we recorded it. And six weeks later, Sid died unexpectedly. Wow. And there was more in that man's head about special tactics. He had forgotten more than, than 99% of us will ever learn. And it was this, this, it was a catalyzing moment for me where I realized, look, I have access to guys that have, you know, the last episode that we just launched was a, a debrief of the Bataclan raid in Paris, which is, I think one of the most heroic hostage rescues it is. It is when we did the debrief in LA, I told the teams, all of you have a tactical nightmare. There's something that you think about at night that scares the crap out of you. None of them are as bad as this case was. And because of the relationship that we have with the team, I was able to sit down with one of their operators who we, you know, who is anonymous. We don't give any information about him because of the nature of their current assignment, but walk through the entire event. What are the lessons learned? What do you wish you had done? What did you see? What didn't you see? You know, basically the, go, going back to the rattlesnake analogy, tell me everything you know about the rattlesnake and the ability to bring that information to people. I mean, nobody's going to meet this guy. Nobody in the U S will ever meet this guy. Every single one of us can learn from him by listening to his podcast. And, and that to me has really, um, it's been really fulfilling because I'm hearing from teams all over the, all over the world. Hey, I heard this podcast. It changed the way that we did this. It changed the way we looked at this. It made us think about this differently. And it's, I think that, that the kind of platform that you've created and the kind of platform that, that we've created gives direct access to end users to absolutely world-class information that they otherwise would never get access to. And imperative information, right? I mean, why is anybody not able to get their hands on this when they work in a profession that's life and death and not only for themselves, but for others? It's like we have criminal history in the, in the United States, right? So you can, as a police officer, a lot of cops don't know this, uh, any cop who's a sworn law enforcement officer who has an active investigation and there is reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed and it's somebody that you have reasonable suspicion that they believe that they are the ones who committed the crime. You can access something called computerized criminal history. Uh, so not many people have access to the database for it. And it's called CEGIS. Uh, I don't know what CEGIS stands for. Criminal justice, something system, probably information system. system, information system, right? So what's wild is think about this. All these cops have access to it. Everybody has the right to have access to it. Now, albeit you might have only so many users for the portal, you still, you still should be able to, as a police officer, call with the right criteria that user who has access to it and say, hi, this is officer so-and-so. I have this going on out here. I need a full criminal history ran on so-and-so. This is my target. This is why. And as long as everybody's compliant with it, they should have access to it. So they'll read back every time in the United States this person was arrested. Now, there's a lot of purpose that this serves. Number one, it should be included in all police reports. People don't realize that. So it's a really important thing 
in a criminal case to list the what you've discovered through somebody's criminal history. It's a real factor in a conviction, uh, even building of probable cause um, in a case. Uh, two, there are things that a criminal history will reveal. Like, does the person have a criminal history past? Are they have they been, you know, arrested for trafficking? What have they been arrested for in the past? Are they known to be violent towards law enforcement? Were the convictions for assaults on police? Uh, why are they are they a convicted felon? Here's why we have to need to, we need to know that because they're not supposed to have weapons. So let's see a, a bullet in a car, and this guy's the only guy in the car. She's the only girl in the car. What a bullet in the floorboard! Now that triggers the automobile exception because you have a convicted felon who's not allowed to possess ammunition. So all these things are there. And what the most ironic thing is, these agencies will give you a car that you can chase in, tasers that can zap people, pepper balls, pepper spray, a gun, a handgun to shoot people, a rifle to shoot people. Uh, but if you want to get history on somebody's criminal background, when it's appropriate to do so legally, according to the uh, CFR, that's Code of Federal Regulations, no, 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 you're not, you're not allowed to have anything like that. Here's an even better one, John, this is an even better one. You have agency, so every day, all these crime bulletins come out. And essentially now, it's through a system, uh, and every state has it, where it's disseminated through email. So typically, most patrol guys who have access to this will go sit down five, ten minutes before shift or right during muster or right afterwards, or in some downtime, and read the crime bulletins. Here's a wild one for you. Do you know that probably a majority of cops aren't given access to those? So there's a car jacking next door and a, and a bolo for this car. Let's be on the lookout. Three towns over. That car can go right in front of their face and they'll have never have an idea that it existed or any kind of crime trends that are going on because their chief or deputy chief or captain or somebody in their agency doesn't give them access to it. How fucking nuts is that? Well, I mean, you can't, you know, just you can't assume that just because somebody spent their entire life being a criminal that they're going to continue to be a criminal, Dennis. I mean, that's that's kind of the what we see happening in California. Like, oh, this person has a criminal history, but we can't talk about their criminal history. We're not going to use facial recognition because we don't want to stereotype them as a criminal. When the guy's got a 20 page rap sheet, it's his profession. Right. It's not a stereotype. It's a professional assessment. And, and I think that there is a huge problem right now of forcing law enforcement to pretend things are not the way that they are because it is a socially sensitive issue. And, you know, we see it living in the people's Republic of California, as I do. Um, we see it a lot and, and the trade is officer safety, right? The, the trade is, we're going to allow you to go into a situation that's much more dangerous than you realize it is because we don't want you to prejudge information about the suspect. And I, I think it's a really, really dangerous trend. I mean, we see in California, we are passing law after law after law. We're trying to outlaw bite dogs now. We've already tried to outlaw military equipment, which is not none of the, thing, not, none of the things on the list of military equipment, by the way, were developed for the military. They're all developed for law enforcement. But <clears throat> there is this kind of mainstream narrative that is focused on law enforcement as a perpetrator and, and not law enforcement as, as, as a guardian or as a protector. And I think it's really dangerous. And I think we're starting to see, you know, you look in cities like San Francisco and, and Portland and, and Seattle, you're starting to see the byproduct of that because ultimately officers take care of themselves. They become more careful. They become less aggressive. And, and the net effect is crime goes up. You know, we saw it post Rodney King in LA. Um, you, know, you look at crime stats in LA right after the Rodney King incident, when LAPD was vilified for the actions of a, a few officers, right? So it wasn't a policy. Daryl Gates was a longtime friend of mine. Daryl wanted to fire him all the next day. Uh, it was not, you know, that Rodney King incident was not LAPD's policy. It was bad actors. You know, what you see happening in Memphis with the, with the Memphis incident, right? Those are bad actors. I would actually even argue that they were all of these people were completely failed by their agency in the fact of in, in just the sense of training. Oh, yeah, 100 um, percent. Because I don't think any cop. And I, I'm not sitting here trying to pretend or say what happened in Memphis was was correct or proper. But I can guarantee you for having a real conversation that those four or five, whatever they were, who were arrested and charged with murder and all this stuff. I promise you at their interview, when the chief said, what do you want to work here for? They go, ah, you know what? Listen, about eight years, I want to be uh, charged with murder. I want to kill people out here. 
what they were tasked with, I'm guessing, is this job, no training, no guidance, and then social acceptance of this is how things are done in an area like this, where this could have all been avoided. But unfortunately, these fucking dumb agencies are so fucking stupid. They are run by such morons and politics are so ingrained in them. Instead of taking the money that now will pay out to the victim of the Memphis Police Department, uh, whatever it's going to be, eleven point eight million, twenty point six million dollars, you could have taken that eleven point eight million, that twenty point six million, and instead of saying, "Wait, we need training," well, we don't have a training budget. We work with what we got. We do in house. Da da da. Nobody gives a shit. Go to work. Go answer calls, and figure it out on that end. Now we got to figure it out on the other end. It's so interesting how agencies and and silly cities and townships have no money until a court says you owe these people six hundred grand. And all of a sudden, they fuck him up with 600 grand out of nowhere to pay this out. So it's not their insurance policy to pay out. They're self-insured. They're paying out. It's taxpayer dollars. Why would you not take that 611 million and infuse it into training to, one, avoid the embarrassment, but two, to ensure lives get protected? Now, the domino effect of what happened in Memphis is, I promise you, this is going to happen. You're going to have 20, 30% of the Memphis Police Department get the hell out of Dodge because now they're going to beat these people to death. So who's the long-term end loser is the residents of Memphis. They're not 100%. failed by the police department. They're failed by their politicians who failed them way back when, when oh, these cops should get the training deserved. So I'm not sitting here saying that I just have a hard time believing in this profession that they hired five people who were intending to murder somebody. Um, no, I, you know. I think, I think what happens, you know, you look at, because, because I go to so many debriefs and hear so many things, complacency obviously is always, you know, is always there. Um, but it's also, there's downward pressure on standards in law enforcement nationwide, right? There's pressure to be more inclusive and, and to, to kind of ignore criminal histories, to ignore, you know, a lot of the things that you were probably screened for, um, agencies aren't screening for anymore. The the idea of of stress inoculation is has become an offensive one. There was one police academy in California that was giving the cadets a yellow card, and if they felt like they were being harassed, they could raise the yellow card, and the instructors would have to back off of them. Wow, right? Which I'm assuming then you just hand them out to all the criminals because you know if you hold up the yellow card, the, obviously the guy that's beating the crap out of you and trying to take your gun is is going to immediately stop. It's amazing. But like this idea that this is a, a dangerous job. And it's a stressful job. And, and if we do not stress inoculate people on the front end and we don't screen out people that don't belong on the job, the byproduct is what you see happening, right? It, it is, that is the net effect. We're under training guys. We're not, we're not putting them through enough stress in the academies. We're not screening them. We're trying to be inclusive to the point that like, oh yeah, you know, he used a lot of drugs in college, but oh, God, you know, he stopped a year ago. Um, like it's, it's, you are gradually little by little eroding the foundation underneath the officers. And, you know, I always say like, I, I, I don't know how many parts you can change on a Ferrari before it's not a Ferrari anymore. Like if you change the doorknob, meh, probably not. Maybe even the wheels, probably not engine gearbox. Like at what point does it stop being a Ferrari? At some point here, we are putting officers on the street that are undertrained, They're under supported they get in a dangerous situation that they're unprepared for and, and they make a bad decision. And, you know, it's, 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 it's unfortunate that we're doing that. And then we're going to turn around and vilify the agency and vilify them when really what we've done is we've cut budgets and we've eroded training for political ideology and for political purposes to the point that, you know, we've set those officers up. And it's, it's, it's reprehensible. It really is. It's, I, I, well, there's I, no, there, there, yeah, I mean, there's, and there's no accountability at the upper levels, no political accountability. I mean, why is Lori Lightfoot not in prison for 7,000 murders and convicted, right? When she literally in the most dangerous city in the country put orders out that Chicago police could no longer engage in foot pursuits. Why is Lori Lightfoot not being prosecuted? I have no idea, right? And we don't do that. We don't do that right. anymore. Like you look at Silicon Valley Bank fails, the federal government's going to bail them out. We're not going to put somebody in jail for it. The whole financial crisis, nobody went to jail. We've we've kind of come to the point that we believe that entities are somehow a thing. Like, oh, it's it's the business that did a bad thing. We'll charge them a fine. Um, charging them a fine and political pressure is not going to solve things. 
there have to be consequences to individuals. People individually have to pay or they don't. And, and the thing is like, there's no, there is no downside as a politician to cutting police training budgets, to eroding training, to lowering standards. Worst case scenario, you get voted out of your job, right? But the, the, the wife that gets handed the flag, she has an entirely different experience based on your actions. And, and I think it's, that is, yeah. it's a dangerous, I mean, it's a dangerous mindset that we have right now. Oh, it's wild. And, you know, it's so interesting that you'll have frontline supervision being told they have accountability, but top end supervision has none. Yeah. Uh, it's just amazing how they just wash their hands and redact themselves clean of, of any, uh, dude, I uh, listen, uh, I'm going to try to keep this as vague as possible. There was recently an event that I'm aware of. And the first thing that was brought to my attention was we couldn't find this guy for seven or eight minutes and he was bleeding out. But the town opted to not get the GPS option because it was more expensive for the fucking body worn camera. Had we done that? And the dude lived barely, barely. Yeah. And it's just like, these are the decisions you make when you don't want to invest in, in some of our top priorities in law enforcement. Uh, uh, you know, law enforcement should be a top priority for this country. Um, and then what that means is investing. You want a more professional cop? Well, you can't defund them by one fifth of their training budget. NYP was defunded a billion dollars. They had a 110% exit rate increase this uh in 2022 over 2021 so what you're sending a signal i mean you know who you're getting now they make they just reduce the the quality or the requirements of the law enforcement uh recruit where they don't basically what they said is like we'll take anybody uh you know in the past we had we had some standards now we don't the only solution i see now at the moment to try to stop the bleed is to maintain standards and learn how to work with a smaller, at the moment, a smaller staff. And essentially by that, law enforcement does spend a lot of time doing dumb shit. Um, so we need to reappropriate what cops do. And I think a lot of this stuff can be done with technology. And, you know, again, somebody reached out to me recently and said, like, hey, do you see this is going I've talked to this on the last podcast. See what's going on with the LAPD. They're making a lot of this stuff be non-police reactionary. And I'm like, yeah, at the surface of it, you probably have a knee-jerk reaction like, oh, that's fucked up. Cops aren't doing that anymore. But let's look at that list. You know, I can agree with 11 of these 12 things. Yeah. I don't think you need to be having a cop come to your house because a tree fell in your pool. Take a picture, submit it online, write your own report. What happened? Here's a very yeah. small narrative. 100%. Um, I don't think you need a cop coming to your house because, you know, um, from, from uh, and I said this before, a guy from, you know, was got a call from somebody trying to get his social security number. And the call came out of like, you know, somewhere in Africa. Like there's nothing we can do about that. They know that we know that, but I think you should like leave us available for the stuff that's really important. Like stopping significant crime. Uh, I would actually reallocate a lot of people's energy and efforts to prioritizing what the most important things are. So, you know, we have resources. They're just being used improperly. And, and if you'd like to, you know, I just, that, that's just how I see it, man. And, and there could be just so many solutions, but unfortunately what happens in politics and, and public profession is these people, you have to understand a majority of people don't know how to resolve issues. They don't know how to problem solve. I'm telling you, they don't. I watch it all the time. So they just do something and think it was something. You watch it in business. I've seen it a thousand times. People say, hey, can you take a look at my business? Things aren't going good. You know, and I'll, I'll go to a business and I'll, I'll come in and I'll, I'll see what the fuck's going on. And they're like, they're sweeping the floors. Nobody in the place. They're sweeping and cleaning the place. What are you doing? Uh, we're cleaning the windows. Why? We like to keep a clean shop. Respect. There's nobody in here. I've been here for 20 minutes. There's nobody in here. Yeah. What's your social media look like? We don't have one. What do you mean you don't have one? I don't have an Instagram page. You guys are a food industry. How do you not have an Instagram page? It's literally where you should be. Instagram. Where's your TikTok at? Well, I don't know how to work that. So you're in here doing things that you think are going to help your business, I guess in your mind, that have nothing to do with actually selling a product. None of the things you're doing, you're just doing something to do something. It's no different. And those businesses fold all the time. I, you, you'll watch people buy business. This actually business I'm talking about, they bought it from somebody who knew how to run a business, who sold it to them because they had financial hardships uh, due to like other life events, some significant stuff that they could not predict. So they had to leave the business. And all of a sudden, the person showing up and running the business to the fucking ground. This thing with a great reputation because they have no idea what they're doing. You took it from a guy or a girl who knew what they were doing, and now you've, you've taken it. And people are confused, man. And the most confusing thing about law enforcement 
and public entities is you have a never ending cash flow. So the the taxpayer money line budget seven seven you know seven one seven four three eight they're all going to continue to feed your bad decision making because there's no repercussions to it, right? Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing, but I have endless money to just blow because it's not my fucking money. But if you took those same people, some of these leaders, these politicians, and you put them in a business entity, John, they fucking mash these things into the ground in about three weeks. Oh, yeah, 100%. Right? They'd yeah, be I'm bankrupt. Just... Everybody'd be fired. They'll be laid off. And they just, because they have an endless flow of money, you know, you see, you see, uh, grand, grandpa died. Petey took over the fucking family farm. Three years later, family farm is up for sale. The whole thing's a disaster. The food quality went down. Petey's, you know, it, you can't, it's fucking it because you're not, you're not qualified to problem solve. And we're not saying that you're not a good person. What we're saying is you need to look elsewhere and have consultants. It's no different than like the state of New Jersey, for example. Why do they contract or well, the state of California, the state of Pennsylvania? Why do you see private contractors? doing the work on the road, right? It's never like the state trucks or the county trucks. Why is these companies we see over and over again, the ones out there digging up the road and doing the road? Because they've probably realized that they can get the job done a lot better than we can. We don't know how to do this. And it's so much money to submit to just giving it over to these guys because they can get the fucking job done. It's just amazing it, what the relationship what they want. It's interesting. You, you raise a really interesting point that I think is currently happening in law enforcement. There is a move and, and, you know, what you see happening agencies across the country, because we deal with agencies all over the United States, is the people that are promoting are the ones that are politically savvy and the ones that have stayed out of trouble. It's not the guy who went and worked narcotics and then worked SWAT and maybe got assigned to a federal task force who got into shootings because he was in dangerous situations and was always out, you know, being proactive and being aggressive. And as a result, you know, had six force complaints or six personnel complaints. That's not the guy that's promoting. The guy that's promoting has spent his entire career in an admin side and has managed to avoid any kind of trouble. And so what you have when you promote them is somebody who has managed to stay out of trouble, but has never really done much. And the guys that should be leading the agency, the guys that have the expertise that are doing training and are doing stuff on their own are marginalized. And so the corporate knowledge that should be accumulating at the top is actually not. And, and you know, I see it all over the place. I mean, we see the number of times that, that you know, I, I've heard in debriefs of a, a SWAT commander having to explain to a deputy chief what chemical agents are or wild. what flashbangs are. And it's like, this oh, it's is the joke. guy that is responsible for making the command decision and has no freaking idea what anything this team does and doesn't take the time to go get educated and doesn't take the time to go train with the team or watch the team move. And then they, they get there and they're like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to, we're not going to deploy any gas. We're not going to have a Waco here. You're not lighting this place on fire. It's like, well, no, that's not how this works, chief. No, no, no. We're just not going to do it. And so you end up with this decision inertia. And, and I think that one of the things that people don't understand is not making a decision is making a decision. You are, you are choosing not to decide when you don't make a decision. The problem is societally, we won't punish you for that. If you sit there and do nothing. For the most part, that is the best move for your career. Now you see like, like Uvalde, you, you see public outrage because they did nothing. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't the action that people expected, but it really has to be an extreme case like that before we, we react to it. We, we are willing to let, you know, indecisiveness be, be a, a good trait. And, and I think that's a really dangerous trend also. I think that we need to stop promoting people and focusing on those who can stay out of trouble their whole careers. Like I look at the guys that raised me that are now regarded as legends in the, the tactical community. None of them would succeed in a modern law enforcement environment. None of them. Because they all got in trouble early in their careers, right? They were all aggressive street cops who were, you know, getting in trouble and, like, but you ended up being really the, the, you know, the, the, the smartest guys in the room long-term, but they got there by making those mistakes, right? right. They got there by, by, by having the, the, you know, going to the school of hard knocks and, and showing up with a lot of experience and going to a lot of debriefs and, you know, learning a lot and reading a lot and 
Those are the guys we want making the decisions, but that's not necessarily what's happening in a lot of places. I mean, you're speaking to one, one of my famous lines in classes. I'm here to tell you that I've made every fucking mistake that you can possibly conjure up on duty and off duty. Yeah. Um, I have had reckless behavior. I, I engaged unhealthily with alcohol and uh, addictions. And, and I, I, I'm telling you, I am here today, 22 years later, to tell you what I've learned, to help you avoid some of these things and to guide you down a path of, man, I wish somebody would put their arm around me when I was a kid as yep. a cop and said, hey, because I never had bad intentions. I was just misguided. And I have to own the things that happened in the past. Sure. And it's a real story of why I'm here now. You know, I'll tell you one quick story. You're going to enjoy this. This guy gets promoted at my agency where I worked and uh, becomes, again, the person who's making the legal decisions on the SWAT team. Now, our SWAT school, I think, was like three or four weeks. And you went to the SWAT school. They actually had their own little patch they had made up. Then the indoctrination of passing SWAT school was you got to wear this patch. So it was like a lightning bolt on it and shit, the typical SWAT patch. Really thought, you know, it's really thoughtful. So everybody who wore the SWAT patch, the, you know, the the military gear and the, the drop holsters and the helmets and all that shit, these guys earned it. So when this guy got promoted to this next level, he's going to be the, the thing. This motherfucker walks in wearing that shit, but he never went to SWAT school. And I said, could you imagine what that means to everybody on the SWAT team? Actually, and SWAT school was hard. You know, can you imagine what that means to now? What are you saying to, to the to the 30 guys on our SWAT team that this fucking asshole that nobody likes is now walking down the hall dressed like you, but never earned it? Yeah. Like, what did you just, what's the signal you just sent to these people? And now he's the guy you got to listen to who's upfront fraudulent. And dude, this guy has no fucking problem being that kind of fraud. Yep. And he's a boss walking down the hallway like, like nut. And I got to tell you, even if he was tasked with the duty, if he would have said like, hey, you know, I have to do this. Is this was position man's? Bro, I'm telling you, I would still show up in just my regular police uniform. The guy didn't go on the fucking calls with them. He didn't go into the buildings. He sat in a fucking bus and listened and made a quote unquote legal calls, although he hadn't been a cop his whole goddamn life. I don't know how he's making legal calls, just that his rank designated it. And I get it. Granted, you had to do this. Man, show up. I got to be here, guys. What do you think? Consult these other guys. But I'm also not going to insult everybody on this team by showing up dressed like you are because you all earned it. I didn't go through SWAT school. I'm not going through SWAT school. And I'm not going to wear fucking digital camo. And I just remember seeing that. That's a thought in my mind. I remember so I see this guy and I went to somebody I go, is this motherfucker really showing up dressed like this here? Proud. Like, like he earned it because he scored good on the fucking test. Yeah. On the, like the written test to get promoted. Like that shit sense. And, and this motherfucker just was the biggest fucking fake there ever was. He's such a piece of shit fake. It drives me insane. Um, and, and, and it's like his legacy never leaves him. Anybody you talk to, they fucking hated this guy, how he's comfortable having that legacy. And I say this publicly because I want you to know that once you're that guy, you can't ever not be that guy. It is almost impossible to come back with like stabbing somebody in the back. Once they know you're a rat fuck and you did, I'm going to talk about doing something that's morally correct and reporting somebody. I'm talking about that's some rat ass, sneaky ass. Let me get ahead by stepping on this motherfucker's face and shoving it into the ground to benefit myself. Shit. That's who you are for life, man. You can't shake that. Once you're a piece of shit, it is hard to come back from piece of shit land. You know, you really have to ask for forgiveness in the world. So um, that's that's what I refer to as a boner in the boy's shower moment. You get exactly one boner in the boy's shower in high school. And you are boner boy for the rest of your life. It's bad, dude. <laughs> you it's know, not it's like, There's another saying that goes along with it, and I guess maybe for the coot that it has to do with like, I'll I'll, I'll, get, I'll go light. You get on your knees once, you're on your knees forever. Yeah, yeah, fair. Yeah, right? no, it's, like, it's, like, it's, but the problem is that societally, we're supporting that, right? That's what's getting elected. That's what's getting appointed. We we are not digging deep on people we are we are looking for the person who claims credit and tells you how great they are and and this is you know to go full circle back to where we started with our conversation one of the problems we have right now in the training community in 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 the educational community is you know people can buy google adwords they can spend money they can they can you know do social media promotions they can force themselves to the top of the rankings and people conflate that with they're good at what they do. And, and one of the things that, that I'm trying to do with what we're doing, and I know that you're trying to do is to filter that information and bring 
the end user real legitimate expertise and, and guys who really know what the hell they're talking about that, that are going to tell them, you know, the, the, the experiences that you had early in your career make you credible to say, Hey, this is a rattlesnake. And I know, cause it bit, it, it bit me three different times. Right. And, and, and here's what the effect of that was. And I think that, that that's part of the challenge with the current educational environment and the current media environment is there's a lot of noise. And it's important that when we find signal, that we, we highlight that signal and we share it because that is in, in the law enforcement community, as long as I've worked with cops, word of mouth is how guys learn, right? It's, it's, it is amazing. And it's true all over the world. It is all over the world. You know, you can be in Paris, you can be in, in the Netherlands and, and a tactical cop is a tactical cop. And if he knows somebody, you know, and they know you and they're willing to vouch for you, you're good to go. Um, and, and I think that as a community, there is not enough sharing of information taking place right now. When you find a good source, when you find good information, tell everybody, you know, about it, because that's the only way we're going to get the real experts in front of the end users and save guys' lives. I mean, if you ever think about when I talk, it, I guess people could misconstrue it, but essentially what I'm saying is we're not the only show in town. Nobody says street cop training is the only show in town. What I do know is that when you show to a class like ours with our logo on it, I promise you it's been vetted Yeah. because I'm telling 95% of people that apply to be instructors here that I'm sorry, you don't qualify. And what I'm saying to you is, uh, I also think there's other great shows in town. Um, and I, sure. I am certainly ready to put them on the same track that I'm on. And I want you to go take their classes as well. I'm not here because I'm solely motivated by money. You're a business guy. You understand that we have to procure revenue for the thing to grow and to get to sure. more people. Um, so I, I, but I also want to caution people on like, Hey, you know, be careful because you know, it doesn't take long or many years in this profession before you show up to some of these training programs. You're like, this is kind of crap. Like, yeah. Um, we have built street cop training on our reputations. Most of our is word of, uh, of our growth is word of mouth. Yeah. No bullshit. hundred percent. That's really it. The podcast is, is word of mouth. I mean, the first thing you said to me, when we started was like, Hey, it's really good. And I appreciate that, man. So if you're saying that to the guy who hosts the motherfucker, imagine what five people are telling 10 of their friends uh, yeah. about listening. Why do we have a half a million subscribers essentially in less than two years of doing this coming up on our two year anniversary, actually even starting the podcast. And there's a reason because I want to ensure that the product that we're putting out on this podcast is a good product that's reliable. And listen, sometimes we miss, we've had some real crappy ones. Uh, now, if we have a real crappy one, we're like, trash it. Like just put it in the garbage. That's it. Like we can't, that person is going to get mad that they're not going to be on the thing. Uh, by the way, John, you've, you've qualified. You're going to make it. That's good. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, listen, I want to end this, but I want to end it with the invite back on. Let's do this again. We have a lot more to talk about. I have two reasons why I have to end it. One, I have a call in, Hmm, was supposed to be in about 10 seconds. Uh, and two, I have to urinate. And three, I haven't eaten since seven o'clock last night. And I did legs this morning. So I'm either going to pass out. My phone's going to ring. Nobody's going to answer it. And I'm going to urinate myself all at the same time. Uh, or we I'm, can I'm, I'm willing to wait another 30 seconds just to watch the show. Just yeah, so yeah, I, I'm not. Because these are really expensive <laughs> pants that I have wearing. And I don't want the place to stink. Uh, so... With that being said, this was a wonderful podcast. It, I thought it was really good. And sometimes I'm really surprised of how good these things turn out. This is probably one of the better ones that we've done, no question about it. Thank and I'd like to invite you to do this again with me, even, even in the nearby future, if, if you're okay with that. Anytime, brother. Any, anytime you got something you want to talk about and and it, it, any any of your users, any of any of your instructors, you know, sharing information is how we keep people alive. I am happy to be a resource and, and refer people to other people or share information with anybody that needs it. So anything I can do to support what you guys are doing, I'm happy to do. Yeah. And some of the questions I had that we didn't get to is like, talk about technology and the improvements, what's on the horizon for body armor and technology. Yeah. And the other one was, so we can come back to this later on. I wanted to discuss some of the feedback from people that you've worked with and you know what separates you guys from, from the others. So we'll try to like memorize and remember that later on. So when we come back, we don't know where we left off. Uh, but yeah, with that perfect. being said, where can people find your in, uh, information on you and your company? So uh, the debrief is just the debrief dot live uh, or wherever you, you know, wherever you consume your podcast, the debrief is it's the debrief with John Becker uh, second season and great stuff this year. Um, Artvark tactical.com is, and then project seven armor.com. 
Uh, and you know, my information is available on those sites and the debrief and, and happy to hear from anybody with suggestions for future episodes. You know, if you're aware of a really interesting case or, a, you know, something that we should bring forward, please, please bring it to our attention because that is how we can better serve the community. I'll see you, man. Thank you for being Take on. care of yourself. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.